All right, so just a little bit about New Mexico New in case you don't know about us. In January uh, 2021, we created New Mexico New, and, and New stands for New Elder World. So we're a social prophet on a mission to create an age-friendly world where we engage 50 to 70-year-olds and encourage, and encourage us to share our wisdom, our experience, and our expertise with our communities. We call ourselves New Elders for that reason. And right now we have this pathway of engagement through learning events, and we're working to build another pathway called the, really it's an elder job board. So it is a, will be an application that will help pair elders that are looking to volunteer and or supplement their income with work to age-friendly employers, um, nonprofits, small businesses, startups, municipalities. And right now we're looking for funding for that. And you saw the, the slide that talked about that. So with that, let's get started with today's event. I also wanna uh, say that we, we are using and we are a partner of Project ECHO. If you don't know what that is and you're in New Mexico, it's a treasure that we have. It is um, out of the UNM hospital and it was created to democratize knowledge and get best practices to lots of underserved populations across the state initially for um, medical practitioners to treat hepatitis C. It has grown leaps and bounds since then. So check them out, Project Echo. You could Google it. And uh, they, their goal, they just have a small goal called touch the lives of 1 billion people by 2025. And they're going global. Uh, they're a great partner and we appreciate their support. All right. So we are going to invite you to uh, participate in a survey that you saw the initial of it. And we really want to get input so that we know we are, we are building things and doing things for the elder community that are valuable, not just what our ideas are, but your ideas. So we ask that you, that you participate in the survey. And if you open the link, I know it opens a browser and so you can answer it later. Just please remember to answer that before you close your browser. Okay. All right. With that, we'll get started. Uh, thank you, Jillian. She put the link in the chat as you can see it. All right. With that, we'll get started. And I want to start with our first speaker. So today we're joined, we're lucky to be joined by two different parties. One is the first one is Christy Carbon Gall. She is an estate attorney, an estate attorney, and we're lucky enough that. A few years ago, she decided to run for the Bernalillo County probate judge, and she is going into her second, she's unopposed for this, so she's going into her second term as that. She brought to that role a whole bunch of experience as, from being an estate attorney for years. And I met her back in 2005 when we moved back to New Mexico, and we needed an estate attorney to do our, our documents here. Since then, I have referred quite a few people and quite a bit of my family to Christy. And so today I get to refer all of you to her. So with that, I will see if we can spotlight Christy and um, bring her up. And then um, I, I'm just so glad and so thankful to Christy that you made time. She's one of the busiest people I know also. So yeah. I'm, we're really fortunate to have her today to share her wisdom and and humor, so I'm, I know I'll laugh a couple of times through this. So um, I was asked to speak today and I just wanted to go through this with you. Um, I, when I do a tutorial on estate planning by itself, um, that's like an hour and a half to two hours and that is not what I assumed anybody wanted to do on a Friday at 11.30. So what I did is I wanted to highlight the things that I have seen that are becoming, that are the most, to ask questions, but also things that became an issue during COVID that I thought were really important for um, people to be aware of. So I, I, I take this from the perspective that you already have estate planning documents in place. And if you don't, these are things that you need to think about when you go to do your estate planning documents. So one of the things that I um, call this is, it is not if, it's when, um, is because I always am now trying to retrain myself on when I say things like, if you die, because unless you have a secret um, that you need to share with everyone, 
we're all going to get there at some point. So um, I uh, so I'm open for questions while we're doing this, and just let me know if those come up. So a big thing that comes up for people on estate planning is they say, I don't need an estate plan because I don't have that much. And, um, and everyone needs an estate plan. And in fact, the less money that you have, the more important it is that you have your powers of attorney in place and your, uh, so that if something happens to you during your lifetime, we don't have to go to court to have a guardian or conservator appointed for you. But the reason I bring up estate taxes is the first thing is because that seems to be the tail that wags the dog. People think that because they don't have, or they might have estate tax issues, or if they don't have estate tax issues, that they don't need an estate plan. So I just wanted to make sure that people understood what estate taxes are. Currently in the United States, if you are a United States citizen, you can die with $12.06 million, $12 million tax-free. And so estate taxes do not affect most of us. Um, and so that is not, not, not even one of the major considerations I take in, I consider when I'm doing estate planning for someone, but it, because it is something that people, and I think it's based on the media that people think is a big issue. I wanted to make sure that people understood for most of us, estate taxes are not an issue and the state of New Mexico, um, follows the federal estate tax laws. Meaning that if you're not subject to a state tax at the federal level, you are not at the state level either. That is not true of all states. So when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about it in the context of New Mexico. Um, the bigger taxes that people have to deal with are capital gain taxes. And that is if an asset is sold and the gain that is in there is then subject to tax. So one of the things that we try and encourage people to do with estate tax or estate planning, and I'll talk about this further today, is not adding their kid or another individual to the title of their assets. Because when you die in the United States currently, your beneficiaries get the date of death value of the asset. So for an example, I bought my house in the North Valley 22 years ago for $200,000. $200, it is now worth, based on nothing else besides the fiction of real estate, like $600,000 because we've got two acres off the ditch. And so if I put my kids on the deed right now, their basis in the property would be the same as mine and my husband's, which is the 200,000. And, um, but if I let them inherit the house, they inherited at the date of death value, let's say at this point it's 600,000, and they could turn around and sell it and not have any capital gain issue. So one of the reasons I mention this is because very often, and I again will mention this later, People, when they're frantic, they're dying, they're sick, something's going on and they think that, or they've had someone die and they're freaking out that they didn't do their estate plan, they'll start adding children to all of their assets in an attempt to do an estate plan. It has tax ramifications and that's what I want you to leave today understanding is that you need to understand the tax ramifications before you do that kind of thing. And then income taxes, another tax that we pay when we die. IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, subject are all subject to income tax. And remember, the reason that they are is because they were pre-tax dollars. We put them in while we're um, saving for retirement, and it's not subject to tax until we take it out. Well, the same is going to be true for your beneficiaries. So in general, the, the rule in, in the United States is most people have an income tax consequence to their beneficiaries upon their death if they have retirements, and most of us do. Um, and that is a tax that most of us cannot get away with um, paying. Um, some people convert it to Roths so that they pay the tax during their lifetime. That is the only time that it would go to a beneficiary without an income tax consequence. So that would be a Roth IRA. A lot of people do not have those. And so you had the benefit of, of not paying taxes when you put it in, the kids will have to pay income taxes when they take it out. So just another thing I want people to be aware of is because people get very hung up on taxes um, when we're talking about end of life planning. So I just want people to understand the three taxes that could be relevant to, to that situation. Um, in 2010, um, Obama signed the Portability Act. And what that allowed us to do was to allow uh, married couples to take advantage of both their unified credits. So I had said earlier 
that you can die with $12.06 million tax-free. As a married couple, that doubles. And you can do that without any complicated estate plan. Um, and I know these are big dollars, but I do have clients in New Mexico that fall into these categories. So I do want to highlight it a little bit. Um, there also is conversation that that $12.06 million is going to go back down to $5 million. There's enough going on in US in the US today in the government. I don't think estate taxes um, rises to the level of making sure Social Security is okay, that Medicare is funded. Um, you know, we have a deficit. So this is not something that raises um, to the top of the list, but it is something we discuss as estate planning lawyers. Because if I have a client that's on the cusp of an estate tax issue, say they're worth $7 million as a couple, it's something that we talk about so that if it goes back to $5 million, they're being proactive in planning around estate taxes. If you are subject to estate taxes now, upon the first to die of a spouse of a married couple, then you have five years to make the election to appoint to assign those assets that are the $12.06 million to uh, in a form that the IRS provides, a 706, so that the IRS knows on the second to die of a married couple that those assets have already been subject to the portability election. That's more complicated than most people need to know, but I wanna make sure it's on people's radar. Um, let me go back and just say one more thing about this. The reason I also bring it up is because people have very, some people have very um, complicated trusts and estate plans based on estate plans that were done before 2010. Because when I first started practicing 25 years ago this week, I was sworn in, um, which feels like a gazillion years ago. Um, when I first started practicing, it was $675,000 per person as a unified credit. So um, at that time, we had to do an AB trust in all people who are worth over $675,000. So I'll have people who come to see me now that have estate plans that are 20 or 30 years old that are more complicated than they need now, and they require work to be done on the first to die, a retitling of assets and um, more complication than most couples want. Um, it's not true of a blended family when you might have stepchildren involved, but it is something that if you have an estate plan that is that old, it would be worth having somebody else look at it to see if it can be simplified. No one wants more complication than they need at the, de at the death of a spouse. So we try and simplify it so that makes it easier. Paul, so, do you have a question for me? Uh, Christy, uh, Larry, Ollie has a question. So Larry, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Thank you. Hi, Christy. Um, five years from when, please? The date of death of the, um, the first spouse. Thank you. Okay. Um, so again, I just want to remind people that I'm doing some highlights of things that I think are really important for people to consider in their estate planning. So I already mentioned in the beginning, powers of attorney are super important. In New Mexico, we have a healthcare power of attorney, and then we have a durable general power of attorney. I'm going to talk about both today. So you need both. Um, the, the durable healthcare, I mean, the durable general power of attorney includes a provision that says, if I don't have a standalone healthcare power of attorney, this person can make those decisions for me. But I'm just going to give an example of an estate plan I'm sending out today. They named Bank of Albuquerque as their trustee and their power of attorney. Well, Bank of Albuquerque won't make healthcare decisions for you. So if you if you include that in your durable power of attorney and think your healthcare is covered, it isn't because they can't they don't have those skills. That's not what they're going to do for you. So I, I there's no reason for people not to have both. So one thing I remind people is even though your documents that you did 25 years ago, again I'm using this as an example. The, the documents you did 25 years ago, you haven't changed. Those same people are the people you want to make those decisions for you. That doesn't mean that if you walk into a bank, they're not going to say, hey, so this power of attorney is 25 years old. We're not super comfortable taking it. So I do um, re recommend to people the freshness date. That's what I'm talking about here, that you do have a document that's like less than five years or five years old being the maximum. And even if it's the same document, just print it off again. Like I'll have people come in and just update theirs and resign. Um, so think about that. The effective date of the power of attorney, on the other hand, means when does it become effective? And I will say again, when we're looking at old estate plans, when I first started practicing, 
you would have it effective after two medical professionals said that you were incapacitated in writing. That does not happen anymore. Um, and essentially it makes them almost ineffective as documents because, well, I'm just gonna use COVID as the example. I sometimes throw COVID under the bus a lot, but this is where we learn some really pragmatic lessons. Um, during COVID, when medical personnel was trying to save people from dying of COVID, the last thing they were gonna do is go write a letter to say, hey, I don't know Joe Smith, but I just talked to him and he seems fine or he seems crazy and, and he's incapacitated. Um, so what I always recommend is that you have your powers of attorney become effective upon signing them so that the person that you named could use it if they needed to. When I get pushback from clients on that, what I say to them is, do we need to reevaluate who you're naming? Because if you don't feel comfortable with them being named and working with you immediately, then we should, re we should think about somebody else. Um, I, the example I always say is, if you would not hand that person your credit card, then we don't need to, we shouldn't be naming them as your power of attorney. Um, the other thing I see in powers of attorney a lot are spouses or partners will name each other and then they don't have a backup. Um, you absolutely need to have a backup. And the reason you do, and, and again, I'm using an example from this week. I have a mother and daughter who live together and they travel together all the time in the car. So even, you know, driving to Smith's to get groceries, if they're in a car accident, we need somebody named in that power of attorney that's not one of them. So if they're both in the hospital, somebody else can make that decision. So a big pushback I say to people is, is this person regularly traveling with you in the car, airplane, on vacation? If so, definitely need a successor, but best practices, absolutely, you should have at least one backup, if not two. I'm not a big fan of having in the um, financial power of attorney or the durable general. Most financial institutions do not like two people serving together anymore, and I'm not a fan of doing it. We're finding fewer and fewer banks that will allow two powers of attorney to work together because they have no way of monitoring that situation from the bank's perspective. So it's just another thing to keep in mind. What I'm talking about is you name Joe Smith first and then you name Frank Jones second, not them together. Um, the other thing that I find a lot with powers of attorney is people pull them offline. And when people tell me, ask me how I feel about documents being done by people themselves from on the, off of the internet, I will say I just finished paying off my student loans five years ago for three years worth of graduate level law school. Um, and so feel free to do it yourself. <laughs> and that's, how I, that's pretty much how I leave it. But um, I find people all the time who pull them off of the internet and they're like, well, this doesn't, uh, doesn't um, involve anything that's relevant to me. So they'll take out things like natural resources and where it says in the power of attorney that your agent can deal with natural resources. So I had a person a couple of years ago who did their own and redacted that because they said, I don't have any natural resources. Well, in fact, they did because they had three acres out in the middle of New Mexico and they had mineral interests. And so when that became an issue, the person who was named after their parent became incapacitated, couldn't deal with it. And so sometimes people are really bothered by too many words. I don't know why. And so I'm like, why take stuff out that might be relevant in the future? Don't redact your statutory powers of attorney. There's a reason a statute has, the statute says, your power of attorney can do the following, I'm making this up, but 36 things. Because those are 36 things that in the past, we have found that a power of attorney needs to do from selling a house, selling a business, renting out a property, dealing with life insurance, all of those things you want your agent to be able to do for you. Hey, Christy, this Paula, oh. this Paula yeah. one question on that. The um, putting people on as payable on death on like checking accounts and savings accounts, what's your opinion on that? We'll get there in just a sec. It's my next oh, slide. Okay. 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 No problem. Okay. Um, and so, and the only other thing I want to say here about the powers of attorney is the healthcare power of attorney. Um, it has the living will in it. And documents that were done pre-1997 might be a standalone healthcare directive and a separate living will. In 97, the Healthcare Power of Attorney Act was changed and it's all one document. So one of the things on powers of attorney people will say is, you know, Presbyterian has a form. I filled it out while I was there. Those are really meant for while you're in the hospital and they have you sign them if you don't have one that's standalone. The power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney in New Mexico is much broader than that. It takes into consideration if you need long-term care and your agent would need to hire healthcare professionals to come into your house. 
It deals with going to doctor's appointments with you. It's much broader. And so I'm not saying your Presbyterian one doesn't work if you're having a procedure done and they want you to do one while you're there, but that is definitely not the end all or be all. People will also ask about five wishes. That is not a standalone healthcare power of attorney. That is essentially a document that says, and I think they're fabulous, so don't, don't take this the wrong way. It's a document that lays out your values about end of life, and I use it as an addendum to the healthcare power of attorney, so your agent has some more direction about that. There's also the most form, which is that prescribed do not resuscitate or DNR. I'm also an advocate of that, and that is something that you take that's an accompaniment, again, to your healthcare power of attorney that you would have your physician sign that says, hey, I want a DNR and I'm not kidding. So you have your, your physician sign off on it while you're happy and healthy because you know something happens. You want everyone to understand that this is real and you, want to, you do not want to be resuscitated. So putting children on accounts and deeds, which is what Paula was asking. And I say children, but it could be anybody. I just use this because this is typically what happens. Again, I think it's a panic mode when people start doing this or they think it's going to be more administratively efficient. I absolutely will tell you, I do not agree. And so what I will say to you, and I'm dealing with a case right now where somebody put their child on all of their accounts and took their name off for, to qualify for Medicaid. And it's been over six years, so there's not a Medicaid fraud issue, but the daughter has now spent all of that money and mom needs long-term care. So don't do those things. I don't care how trustworthy your kid is, somehow this is gonna come back to bite you. Putting your kids on accounts and deeds first causes tax consequences to them. So they do not get the step up in basis if you put their name on the deed. If you want to do that, we have what's called a transfer on death deed. That names your kid as a beneficiary of the house. They get it upon your death. It's revocable during your lifetime or until you become incapacitated and they still get that step up in basis. You also can refinance or use that property for long-term care if you need to. But if you put your kid on the deed during your lifetime, it is subject to capital gain. If they get divorced, bankrupt, or have a lawsuit filed against them, your house is part of their assets. So there are so many reasons not to do that. And putting children on bank accounts has the same issue. They, if they have any liability exposure, you will have liability exposure. Um, the one thing that I have modified a little bit, sorry, um, the way I'm doing this today is making it a little, um, my, my slide shows being a little crazy. Um, the one time, though, but this is what I tell you about learning in COVID. When I say don't put your kid on the accounts, what I learned during COVID is because it took so long for death certificates, because so many people were dying in droves, and the and OMI is slow usually, but it was even slower because there were so many people in, um, that were at OMI, the Office of Medical Investigation. If they died at home of COVID, there has to be a whole process that's done to make sure it's not a homicide. Those Sometimes we had people who died at home and it took six to nine months to get their death certificate, which meant even though we could do a probate because you don't need a death certificate to go through probate, you just need an indication that they died. We need proof that they died, but no death certificate. So I might've been getting probates done at probate court or in my own private practice through district court, but until they had a death certificate to give to the bank or the financial institute or the brokerage house, they could not issue, they could not transfer the money to the estate. So if you have kids who have disposable income or benefit or you know, personal representative or executor that has um, disposable income, they could spend money to get people buried, cremated, whatever, and then get reimbursed from the estate months later. But you know, we have a lot of people in New Mexico who do not have disposable income. They live paycheck to paycheck. Their kids do too. And so we had people whose parents were on ice for months because nobody could afford to do the funeral and the cremation. They had no ability to pay bills for the house, like if there was a mortgage. So what I'm saying, so what I made, I modify my don't put your kid on your account to only put your kid on a small account so that they have access to liquidity. So I have clients who it's a generational thing where people might keep 50 to hundred thousand dollars in a checking account. Don't put your kid on that one. Set up an account with five or seven thousand dollars and put, and I say kid, again, it's whoever would be that person that helps you. Put them on an account that's just for administrative purposes only, kind of a little savings account that they can access if they needed cash when you passed away. Um, I also, and French's is here today, so I'm not going to get it, I'm not going to do a deep dive in this, but one of the things I will say is, 
and again, this is a lesson from COVID, but it's it's been true from all of my practice. The only thing that is very, very time sensitive after someone dies is what's going to happen for the funeral. Are we going to have a burial, a cremation? What, what is that going to look like? And it's not even time sensitive. People can be put on ice. It's the most emotionally um, uh, emergent thing. That is the thing that makes people the, the, the most sensitive is I need to get mom buried or mom's being cremated. I need to get this taken care of. So I have really been encouraging my clients to do prepayment for burial and cremation. And Frenches is going to talk about that today with you guys. But, and I, and I jokingly said this to them, I don't get kickbacks for this. And I've had people ask me that because I am such a huge proponent of this, but it causes, it takes away so much stress and anxiety for your kids or your family members when this is taken care of and they know they just have to make a phone call. And I'm going to let them talk about it more, but I just wanted to say, that is something during uh, COVID and after that I've been saying to people, get that small account set up for liquidity and do your, pre do your cremation and burial stuff. Beneficiary designations. And again, remember, these are like the issue spotting I'm trying to do for people who have their estate plan done or have not done it yet. But beneficiary designations cause lots of problems. Some of them are, um, so there's a couple of things. The biggest uh, issue I see is that and I put it as number two, probably should have been number one, people name minor children all the time, be it are their own children, uh, nieces and nephews, whatever, godchildren, whatever that, kid, that might be. So they'll name their partner or spouse as the primary. And then just because it seems normal, they'll name their minor children as the contingent or secondary beneficiaries. Children cannot be beneficiaries if they're under 18. If they are, we have to go back to court and um, have a conservator, which is a person who will accept those funds for them and hold them until they're 18. First, that's an expensive process. Second, if it's a huge retirement account, you're going to have a kid who inherits, you know, half a million dollars in cash at 18 because that's when the conservatorship ends. So most people want to be more thoughtful than that. You need to have a trust of some sort, either in a will or a standalone trust that deals with those assets. The other thing I always want people to understand is that when you have um, beneficiary designation, so I might have a family that says everything we have is going to our three kids and it's being split evenly, but then they have a standalone life insurance policy or an IRA that's going to the Animal Humane Society. I am fine with that as long as that is what I'm saying, making educated decisions. As long as they understand that it's not tied back to their will or their trust, that's fine. I, the, the, the example that I give about when it's not educated is we have a, you know, a woman who's a widow. She's got three adult children. We do an estate plan, but for her son, Tom, we have a trust set up because he has addiction issues. Um, if she does not go and change the beneficiary designation and her three children are named outright as the beneficiaries, even though I've set up a will for Tom, with a trust for Tom in it when she dies, the beneficiary designation dictates where those monies go to. So even though there's a trust, the money will go directly to Tom because he's named on the beneficiary. So we always make sure we tie it all back. The other thing I will say too about, um, let me go back one, is I represent a lot of people from the labs and I'll have guys who walk in who are in their 50s and we go back and look at their beneficiary designations and they still have their mom named even though they've been married for 30 years and <laughs> They have children and everything else. And it's because when they got out of graduate school and went to work at the labs, they put their mom down and they never changed it. So, you know, it's always good to go back and look and check on those things because we might misremember how we have titled things. And it's, it's always good to go back and just take that look. Understanding your financial situation with your spouse and partner. And again, I, this is estate planning because it's Estate planning is a holistic view of everything you have and what does that look like during your life when you're aging and what happens when you die. Some of the things that I have found in the 25 years I've been practicing is, you know, there's some people who have pensions and their spouses think the pensions continue after they die. They find out when their spouse dies that it, it ended at their spouse's or partner's death. Um, that happens a lot with military pensions and it happens a lot with union pensions. You make a decision when you retire how you're going to do it. Are you going to do it over one life or two? And it's amazing to me how many people do not understand this as a couple and they find out after their spouse dies. 
Also, it's always in that social security is um, an, an entire informational uh, seminar by itself. But there are different ways that social security can be used from a former spouse, either divorced or when you're widowed. Um, um, and there are, you know, if there's a disability component to it. So I always recommend that when someone loses a spouse, that they make an appointment with social security, which could take six months to get in the door, but that they make an appointment to go, go to social security to find out what their options are. You also don't even have to have a deceased spouse. It could be you're divorced and are you eligible? If you're a little bit younger than your spouse, are you eligible from 62 to 65 for their social security? And then you can take yours. There are all these different man, uh, machinations on how that can happen. It's worth calling social security and having an appointment. Um, along the same lines, what I say to people is, um, take, you need to take into consideration before a remarriage scenario of how that will affect your pension, your social security, and whether or not you want to have a prenup. And I say this to people because it is not unusual. I have a huge, um, GLBTQ population that I, that I represent. And after gay marriage was legalized, we did a lot of sit down about, does it make sense? And should you have a prenup and what does it look like? Now these were couples, a lot of them had been together for decades. So it just was the next step for them, but it was something that they had to consider on the pension and social security. What does this look like? And do they have separate property that they want to maintain separately? Same thing for second marriages. So it's just something I really encourage people to do. And frankly, um, and I say this in rural New Mexico, and it doesn't get his laugh, but I am all about living in sin. And if it's a second marriage scenario, really think hard about whether it makes sense to get married or should you just hook up? I'm, I'm fine with that. There will be no judgment from me. Um, but the one thing I do suggest to people is they consider the housing situation. If they bought a house together or if one person moves into another person's house, Make sure that you contemplate that in your estate plan so that upon the death of the person who owns the house, we don't have a situation where the kids are saying, hey, so my mom just died and this is her house. You need to get out. You have 30 days. So that can be thoughtful, but it also can be documented without getting married. Um, I, I said this earlier, so I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor the point on the beneficiary designations. Go back and look who you've named to make sure it coordinates. It is not infrequent that we do a probate on somebody on a second to die situation. And then we find out that after husband dies, wife was named as the benefit, or you know, the opposite. Well, I'm sorry, let's say husband's last to die, wife had died, and then and dad was named on the beneficiary. They didn't do anything about it. And so it goes to his estate. So we always want to make sure on uh, after someone's died that we look at beneficiary designations to update them. There might not be a lot that needs to be done on the first to die, but beneficiary designation review should be done so that you don't have to go back and do a probate on the first to die because that didn't get updated. Um, I also mentioned confirming title of real property. During the last couple of years, there's been so much refinancing. We've had errors done by title companies. It happens, people make mistakes. Um, and so I always look at deeds to make sure that they have been done correctly. If people think it's in joint tenancy and they own it with their spouse with rights of survivorship, I look to make sure that's actually what the, the title company did. Again, with same-sex couples, a lot of times title companies make assumptions and do not do them properly. So I pull, as best practices, I pull deeds for everybody and look at them. The example I always give is my father-in-law owns a property in Iowa, his, his former the farm he lived on with his brothers. And the lawyer in Iowa put them all on joint tenancy, which means it would have gone to the last man standing, not to their spouses. Not what, not what was intended. And until we updated his estate plan, he had no idea that that's what the lawyer had done. So just, you know, it's, it's important to look at them to make sure that they're done correctly. Revocable trusts. I do that about, uh, it's probably about half of my practice. Um, and we're not going to get into what those are today because that's, again, an entire seminar. But when people have them already in existence, because it's a big uh, project to, to do that kind of estate planning, people who moved here from California or the East Coast, all I, those are gonna be people who have trusts uh, because probate's so difficult in those states and expensive. 
But one, so because that first process was so complicated, people are hesitant to touch it again. And so what I want people to understand today is that if you had a trust that you established 20 years ago, you can restate that trust agreement. And what that means is you titled your house 20 years ago in the Smith Revocable Trust dated May 5th, you know, 20 or 1997. Um, the name and the date of the trust does not change. It's a fictional entity that came into existence in 1997. What changes is the trust agreement, which is the document that manages that trust. So you don't have to go through and refund everything again, but you can change your trust agreement to say, hey, the trustee we named has been dead for 10 years, but we don't want to do anything new. You need to do something. You need to update that trust agreement. And then when we talk about funding, what that means is, does your trust, if you have a revocable trust, does it own your assets? Um, because a lot of times, best practices is now when I do a trust for someone, we fund it. That's part of being an estate planning lawyer. 25 years ago, that was not the standard practice. So you would get like a tutorial sent to you after you did your estate plan that said, this is how you do a deed to the trust. This is how you change a beneficiary designation. A lot of times people will bring their, their original documents back to me with that same letter from their lawyer in the envelope still. Um, so they've never done anything, which means then you go through probate and then the probate says everything goes into the trust. So it, it literally defeats the purpose of doing a revocable trust. So if you did a trust two decades ago, go back and see, pull up your bank statement. Does it say it's in the trust or is it in your name? If it's in your name, that's okay. Does it name the trust as the beneficiary of your bank statement? So there's ways to deal with it but make sure you've done it because otherwise there was no purpose in doing the trust in the first place and it just duplicates the work. Um, hey, hey, Christy, oh, I'm going to yes. give, we're going through the time for Q&A because I'm assuming oh. everybody, if you have a question, no, it's fine. Because if you have a question, please answer, uh, ask it in the chat or raise your hand, go to the reactions button and raise your hand. I haven't seen many questions come in, so we're just going straight through. So you got 10 minutes till the end of Q&A too, so. Okay, and I just have a couple more things. Yeah, I was yeah a couple mention. more slides. But please, okay. people, if you have a question, uh, let us know. Okay, so um, I also wanted to highlight the use of limited liability companies, which is what we call an LLC. So these have been used in New Mexico for years to own real property. It's an easy way to, pro to provide yourself liability protection when you're like a landlord. Um, so we set them up for people um, regularly for that. And then it's, a, it's a, also an easy way to transfer real estate to multiple family members. So if a family has four or five rental properties, we put them in LLCs and that's an easy way to transfer it to the next generation where they own them together because they own the company, they don't own the underlying land. Uh, and you can name a kid as a manager or whatever. It's really important and we use them a lot. What I want people to understand about that though is people can set them up through the Secretary of State's office by themselves. So I have had people who set up their own LLCs by filing the articles of organization with the state. But what they fail to do after that is do the operating agreement that says who owns it, how it's gonna be managed. And they don't do separate bank accounts and they don't do separate insurance. So, the legal concept for what the what that what arises out of that is called piercing the corporate veil. So you have this entity, the LLC, that owns your property, but it has to have been treated like an independent entity. It needs to have its own insurance. It needs to have its own bank account. So a lot of people, because they didn't want the hassle of having multiple bank accounts, commingle all of it. Well, that means you have no liability protection because you're going to get sued because you're. You had a rental and a dog bit uh, a neighbor and you're getting sued because you were the landlord. And then they ask you for your operating agreement, your separate bank account information, your separate insurance, and you don't have it. That doesn't mean you can't fix it now. And so I do because operating agreements cannot be found on the Secretary of State's website because they are a legal document. So the Secretary of State can't just give a one size fits all document to the general public. So people will set their articles up and don't understand that there were other steps that they needed to take. So I just put that out there for you to make sure that you have, if you have an LLC that owns rental property, that it's being kept separate. 
The other thing I will mention about, um, oh, sorry, whatever it was, was about to go, I'll come back to it. Whatever it was just slipped out the brain cell. Um, oh, insurance, I'm sorry, it's back. <laughs> I also, if you do not have um, an LLC, but you have separate rental properties, make sure that your insurance company understands that it's a rental. Um, and the reason I say that, and I use myself as an example, this is what I do for a living. And when Dan and I moved from the university down to the Valley, I was renting that property out for three years before I remembered to tell USAA that it was a rental property. If something would have happened during that time period, it would not have been covered. So I use myself as an example because I should have known better. And I just did not even cross my mind because it was insured. I was still paying it. Um, but it would not have been insured appropriately and it wasn't insured for what it was being used for. So I also remind people to do that because it happens all the time where people will have a second or third home that they rent out and then they just don't change the status of from owner occupied to uh, landlord tenant. Updating in general, I will say this. I think that, uh, again, I'm going to throw COVID under the bus and say I think that gave a lot of people uh, incentive to look at their documents and make sure that they have their act together. If you weren't incentivized by COVID, you should become incentivized now to pull your documents out and just look at them to make sure your power of attorney is effective immediately and all the things we talked about today. But I do recommend in my closing letters to clients that they look at them every five years. And I do recommend that they call us every five years. And if they haven't changed anything on their power of attorney, they stop by and as a courtesy, we just print those off and have them re-sign powers of attorney. Um, so that's definitely something that people should be considering. Um, and making sure, and this seems like it's, it's pretty common knowledge, but I'm gonna say this, make sure your estate plan covers everyone that you care for financially or otherwise. And what I mean by that is this, I have clients now who, and we call them the sandwich generation, baby boomers who are contributing to take care of mom and dad who don't have enough money to pay for long-term care, who also might be raising grandchildren financially or even physically raising grandchildren. And so you have to let your estate planning lawyer know, and what I always say to people, if you died on a Tuesday, who are you currently helping live financially or taking care of that we need to cover? Um, so I have some clients who are, you know, contributing $500 a month to a pot for, that all the siblings are doing to take care of mom's long-term care. There's ways to do that. So it continues if you pass away before mom does. And very often in New Mexico, I have grandparents who are raising their children. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Their kids are in jail. Their kids are on drugs. I, you know, who knows? But it is, happens more frequently than you think. And it's not actually even a poverty issue. I mean, I know that that's what some people think, but I have people in all, uh, all uh, um, levels of economics that are doing are raising kids. Addiction does not look just at who, poor people. And um, so we have to make sure that those kids are taken care of um, if grandma and grandpa are actually the ones who are raising them and taking care of them. So just be thoughtful about that. And when I say this about making sure everyone, I include pets. So if you have dogs, cats, birds, birds, ferret takes, they live forever. Tortoises, I'm trying to think of all the animals that I've had to provide finances for. Horses, um, we take care of that too, because you have to say, if something, if I drop dead on a Tuesday, is somebody know to come and let my dogs out and water my, you know, water my dogs, water my cats, whatever. Um, make sure people know that, that you have a, a plan and that somebody has a key to get into your house. Um, just think, I, you, have, you do estate planning like you're dying on a Tuesday or you live another 30 years. Just think about what needs to be done immediately if something happened to you and that somebody knows how to do that for you. And then I'm open for questions. And again, like I had said earlier, when I do an estate planning 101 presentation, it's like an hour and a half to two hours. This is just to do some highlights of stuff that I found during the last couple of years that really are things that people are struggling with. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Christy. I know that was fast for you, but it was great <laughs> knowledge. And I, I didn't know it was 25 years. So that's, that's just, we so appreciate you taking time. Cause again, I know how, I know how, um, how busy you are. 
And I know how popular you are because uh, both with the state attorney and then being the probate judge on top of it. So. Oh, you're welcome. All right. So our next set of presenters are Barbara Shelton, who is um, advanced planning consultant for French funeral and, can, and cremations here in Albuquerque. And she also does a lot of their training. So perfect role for her today. And Mark Ballard, who has um, presented last year for us. I so appreciate Mark. And he is um, director of that advanced planning. And again, we have French, I can attest, they are one of our biggest supporters for New Mexico New, have been for two years in a row. And I can attest myself that they are one of the easiest companies to work with. At, I am, I, I say that to everyone now, because I am so impressed with how easy they are to work with and how much they support our community. So with that, I really want to turn it over to Barbara and Mark. And um, once again, thank you for being here with us today. Afternoon, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Yeah, we're really glad to join both of all of you today. Um, I'm actually really excited about doing this with Barbara. She does a better job than I do. That's why she's a training manager. So, <laughs> but I had the pleasure last year and we love the support of Mexico New. We think they're a wonderful organization. We've watched them since they started and it's been intriguing every year, the more and more they add to the plethora of available um, options for all their uh, members and those who are actually guests as well. So thank you again for your partnership. Barbara, want to tell them a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. So thank you so much for having me and I'm so glad to be a part of this. And Christy, so enjoyed your information that you provided. So many of those things are things that I talk, you know, our team talks with families about. So uh, it's a great, valuable information you provided today. So thank you for that. Um, look forward to kind of talking about advanced planning, you know, and, and how do we um, you know, a topic that's a difficult thing to talk about, but it's an important one. And and thank you too, Paula, for having us here. So um, I'm going to be doing the presentation. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. To kind of start out, we're going to start with something a little fun. Um, I don't know if I'm going to try and see if I can see the chat because we're going to start off with a little trivia. So Please type in any answers that you have for the trivia as we go along here. And, um, and just kind of information that's kind of fun to kind of think about. Um, we don't think about funeral planning in this aspect very often. So um, we're gonna do a, do a couple of questions here and bear with me for just a second. So who holds the world record for uh, the most expensive funeral? Would that be Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, Princess Diana, or John F. Kennedy? Any any guesses? Type it in the <laughs> type it in the chat box there. <laughs> Princess Diana. All right. Well, very good guess. It's exactly right. Princess Diana. She her funeral was over uh, sixty thousand sixty million dollars. Uh, excuse me, sixteen million dollars. And um, the queen actually had said to um, all of the royal family that anybody who does not have a pre-plan um, will be taken out of the will. And she actually meant it and everybody went and got their pre-plan. So we we're very thankful um, for uh, the queen <laughs> letting everybody know how important pre-planning is. And what celebrities um, funeral had their uh, tickets uh, scalped? That was uh, Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, Prince, or John Lennon. Any guesses there? Okay, good guess. Michael Jackson and Prince. It was Michael Jackson. Not the classiest move that they did, but um, it was a concert, basically, that took place. I know one of my favorite artists, I watched the funeral, and it was um, Usher played. And uh, so it was quite a quite a concert that took place, uh, sadly enough, at a funeral. Now, who owns the plot next to Marilyn Monroe? A lot of people, you know, have the same answer. So we've got Joe DiMaggio, Madonna, Hugh Hefner, or JFK. 
Any guesses there? Okay, Joe DiMaggio, that's the most common one, but it was Hugh Hefner. He purchased that um, for about $75,000 back in the 90s and um, uh, very expensive uh, plot. Now, if there's any veterans here, um, this is always a question we'd like to ask. Um, does anybody know um, how many stars should be visible on a properly folded flag? Any guesses? So I'll tell you, it is four. It's four stars for each branch of the military. So each branch of service. So Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. And of course, they always leave out the, the Coast Guard. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go over a little bit of the agenda. And this is um, as I help people go through planning. And um, these are the things that I talk about. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, kind of my, you know, the funeral home and my story a little bit, talk about our final wishes organizer, how do we put a plan together, uh, the common reasons why people pre-plan the acute loss period. Um, it's a universal process that we all go through. And then the five key points to a funeral policy and then customizing a plan. So this is my father. My father, um, he passed away 20 years ago. He was a 30 year special forces Green Beret. And he is why I do this job. Um, I was in travel and hospitality for 25 years. That was my career for, for the majority of my life. But when he um, was diagnosed with cancer, he was given about six months to live and was told to get his affairs in order. And so he asked me, he says, Barb, will you help me plan my funeral? I said, okay, dad, I've never done that before, but I'm glad to help you. And so we went to the funeral home together that day. We planned everything out. Um, he passed about three months after we did his planning. And I remember talking to the funeral director and, and trying to figure out, gosh, what do I do? And, and the funeral director says, Barb, you and your dad did everything. And I was like, no, really, what do I have to do? I don't know what I'm doing. And he says, no, really, he goes, you've got everything done. He goes, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of calling the church and make the arrangements and, and your uncle's bringing in his clothes. And I'm going to be calling Arlington to schedule his service because of his uh, military background. He was um, buried at Arlington National Cemetery. So it was quite a beautiful uh, service for him there. But he is why I do this planning. And as you see at the bottom of this, it says the call, the decisions and the experience. I, even though I knew he was going to pass, I did not know the day he was going to pass. And the day I got the phone call was a really hard day because I wasn't, even though I had a pre-plan for him, I wasn't prepared for that. So all of those decisions though were done. And that's the part that I was amazed by. And so my experience of having somebody who had a pre-plan is why I changed careers. Um, I have been with French now for, um, gosh, eight and a half coming on nine years. And um, I worked for another company for a period of time um, before that. So I've been doing planning for coming on 10 years now. So it took me 10 years to do this, but it's the best decision I ever made. And it's an honor to work for French. It's an honor to serve families and help them put a plan together to make things easier when their time comes. And I'm going to go through kind of the next part of good. How do we, you know, how does this all work? How does this come together? All right. So a lot of you may be familiar with French. Some may not be, but we have um, been family owned and operated for um, over 115 years. Very proud of that. Very proud to be a part of the French family. Um, this is our uh, golf course location on the west side. We have four locations. We know that you have many options available to you in our community. And so our, you know, we're, we're honored to be asked to come and talk. And, and we know you have other options for, pre, for, for funeral homes, but, you know, we want to come out in the community and help educate families about advanced planning and the importance of it. There's over a hundred plus things to do at the time of loss. Christy touched on a lot of those things, but there's there's a lot of details that go into what happens when someone dies. And so the more we can get done on the funeral planning side, the better. 
So one of the things that we do as an as a advanced planning consultant is we provide a final wishes organizer. And we go over and gather information to put a file together that's a real comprehensive plan. We have the vital statistics, if you have a military record, and the vital statistics are the information we need for the death certificate. Name, date of birth, parents' names, occupation, just like a, just like a death certificate. And excuse me for just one second, if you could, I've got um, a little bit of a, a cold that I'm getting over, if you could bear with me for just Sorry about that, I have a little tickle. Um, so the vital statistics is the information we need for the death certificate. If you have a military record, we like to have that on file. Um, any special instructions, details about any uh, funeral arrangements that you want. Um, and then emergency contacts. We have to have family and next of kin. We have to have their contact information so we can set up a plan. And then funeral service requests. You know, we have to have um, one, it, if there's cremation involved, we have to file permits. And, you know, there's some things, details involved that a lot of people don't realize that we have to do on the funeral home side of things. So putting together your final wishes organizer is how we do that. And so there's common reasons why people pre-plan. Everybody has their reasons for getting their planning done. Um, but the number one reasons are, um, so the decisions that would be made then are taken care of now. Um, that's probably one of the biggest things that we hear um, from families is I, I I don't want my family to make these decisions for me. Um, I want to, you know, take control of that. Also, it's going to give you peace of mind knowing that things are taken care of. It's going to give you peace of mind, but it's also going to give your family peace of mind knowing things are done. Um, but the another thing that we hear a lot from the funeral director side is having the family have a pre-plan and there's no doubt what the loved one wanted. When you don't have a pre-plan in place, your family walks in and they say, I have no idea what my loved one wants for burial or cremation and what do they want. Those decisions is what's the most important. And so also some people come in into pre-plan because they want to have the financial side of it taken care of. They want to have the um, everything prepaid. And so we don't know what our family's financial situation will be at the time of our death. So what if they can't afford to pay for our funeral plan? So having those costs taken care of is really helpful to the family. And then also allowing your loved ones, you know, a healthier, you know, positive grief experience. That's something that happened when my father passed away. Having all those decisions done allowed me to not have to spend hours at the funeral home after he died. When you have a pre-plan in place, you're talking, you're cutting that time in half. So I always say it's like a gift of time. You're talking maybe 45 minutes to an hour that your family comes in, they look at everything that was pre-planned and talked about and finalized. They sign some documents and then they can kind of move forward through their day. Now, a lot of people, you know, when you look at the skyline, it's something that we'll always remember. And one of the things that we talk about when we're helping people pre-plan is there's a universal process that happens when death occurs and it's called the acute loss period. And I'm gonna go over that. And I go over this in more detail. Our appointments with our families are anywhere from an hour and a half to two and a half hours. Um, so we go into a lot of detail, but one of those things is we talk about what happened on September 11th. This is a universal process. It's not negotiable. And it's something that we all go through when a death occurs or a tragedy happens. So what's the first thing we think about? We will always remember where we were. When did you hear the news? It's just like when a death occurs, you will know, you will remember when that first phone call comes. Who did you call? That's the first thing people do is they reach out to those that they care about. Because when tragedy hits, we all wanna reach out to the people that we care about the most. And that's exactly what happened then at September 11th. And when did you see that? You know, sometimes we can't comprehend what is real until we see it. So this is part of the process after death occurs as well, is, you know, if you recall, we watched the TV for weeks and, you know, over and over again, staying glued because you couldn't believe what was happening. We gathered as a nation, and that's something that we, what happens after a death occurs as well is 
Everybody gathers together to celebrate the life of the person that passed. And we connected locally. You know, we connect with those people that are closest to us when the first holidays, birthdays, and anniversaries roll around. We always reflect on what is lost. This is where we think about when you have an actual celebration of life or a funeral or memorial service. This is kind of um, the process that happens. And then, of course, celebrating what matters most. And one of the things we think about is one day your friends and family will have their own personal 9-11 experience when they lose you. And that's an actual process that happens every time a death occurs. And we call it the acute loss period. It's the event of death between the event of death and the onset of grief. And it's known as the acute loss period. And this is kind of what we described in the September 11th situation. There is this phase that happens. The inner rim displays the seven phases of the acute loss period. The outer rim displays emotional, relational, and spiritual needs that we all have. And again, this is a universal process. It's not negotiable. The first three phases happen automatically, and the last four phases take careful thought and planning. So if you look at this, hearing, sharing, and seeing is exactly what happens when a death occurs. You hear the news of a loss, you share the news, and you want to see those and support those that we care about. And then we have relational needs. This is where we have a visitation or a viewing. A gathering of people to celebrate the life. And then we have the spiritual needs, which is where the funeral or memorial service takes place. Now, talking about the financial side of things, when you think about um, the costs of funerals, funeral costs double every 10 years. This is a Time Magazine study that was done back in the 1970s. And they talked about funeral costs doubling every 10 to 15 years or so. And it was pretty spot on when they did this study. Now, this is not French cost. This is just a national average for a casketed burial. But this gives you a really good idea of what the cost can be for families as time continues to, to go on. One of the biggest benefits of pre-planning is you lock in and guarantee the costs so those costs that go up, you've locked those in. A lot of people don't realize that, that you can lock in the costs with the funeral home when you do a pre-plan. Also, the funds are protected by an insurance provider. And what that means is in the state of New Mexico, funeral homes are regulated by the state. And so what in New Mexico, we're called an insurance state. So when you set up an, a funeral pre-plan with the funeral home, they have to use a third party company and we use a company, um, it's called Funeral Insurance. We use a company called Funeral Directors Life. They're the ones who hold your monies. The funeral home cannot hold your money in their own bank account, it's against state regulation. And so the monies are held in an insurance policy and it stays there until death occurs. When death occurs, the funeral home will file for those funds and we will be paid at that time. And then one of the things we run into is we don't know where we're going to be in the future. Sometimes we move later on in life. Sometimes our children move out of state and we have to move. Well, the great thing about a funeral plan is it's transferable. It's transferable to any funeral home in the country. So you can take it with you. You never lose the money that you paid into it. Another great thing is you can manage payments on it. Uh, if death were to occur today, your family would have to pay the funeral home the full cost of the funeral plan at the time. But when you pre-plan, you actually can set it up and make payments over time. You pick an, a, a payment plan that's most affordable for you. A lot of people don't realize that. Also, there's a protection period. What that means is while you're making monthly payments, it's an insurance policy. So if you passed away while you're making payments, the insurance will kick in and pay off the balance of the funeral plan. A lot of people don't realize that there's an insurance product when you work with a funeral home. Oh, I didn't know that. Hey, Barbara, uh, Denise Taylor had a question. Yes. Do you want to unmute and ask a question? Yes. Um, if it's an insurance policy and the funeral home goes out of business, does that mean you get your money back? Or how does that work? Yes, that's actually why the it was set up that way is because um, back in the 80s, uh, before the state kind of set that regulation, back in the 80s, there was a funeral home that didn't manage their business real well. Uh, they took their 
People pre-planned their funerals, put it in their bank account, operated their business with that money, didn't manage their business well, filed bankruptcy years later. And that's when the state came in and said, okay, funeral homes, you can no longer hold money in your own bank account. And so that's why it's transferable to be payable to any funeral home. So it's to protect you as the consumer, not only if you transfer to move out of state, but if the funeral home goes out of business as well. So it's a, a really good protection for you. Does that mean you get the same um, things that you requested at the new funeral home at that point, or do you kind of have to negotiate or? Yeah, so usually most funeral homes like locally here, they're going to honor what it is that you had with your plan. Um, in fact, and I'll share this little bit of history with you. French was actually contacted after those families that lost those monies after the company went bankrupt. French was contacted and French took care of a good, if I recall, Mark, I think it was a good 70% um, of the families that had lost their money and we offered to help take care of them. So um, that, you know, definitely is something that, um, you know, can happen with other funeral homes. They'll, they'll honor what was done. And so good, good question. All right. So, so, so one other question, Barbara, is yeah. you talk about it. It's the state that regulates and the insurance policy, but then you say you can transfer it across the U.S., yeah. Right. So then each state has its own policy. So they do. So when you when you transfer uh, an insurance policy, our our insurance policy is called a funeral insurance policy. So mm -hmm. you're transferring funeral home to funeral home. That's what you're transferring. And so if you transfer, some states are regulated differently. I'm going to use Colorado as an example. Um, Colorado is an insurance and a trust state. So they offer the families two options. You can hold your money in a trust or you can hold your money in an insurance policy. They offer them both. So the monies are still protected for the family no matter which way. Massachusetts, for example, um, they're a trust only state. Um, some states are like New Mexico where they're only an insurance. No matter if you're a trust or insurance, if you're transferring funeral home to funeral home, the funeral homes will accept the policy as okay. payment. Okay, great. Yeah, good, good question. So um, one of the other things that we um, help families with is out of area protection. And the out of area protection is a program that offers a lifetime membership. It's worldwide coverage. And this is to cover you in the event that if you passed away 75 miles or further from home, how do you get back? A lot of people don't realize that. So if you die somewhere else, how do you get home? And so when you, um, we offer an out of area protection, we use a company called Sepia Guard. And they're the ones who actually will, um, you set up the membership and then you're transferred back to Albuquerque if death occurs elsewhere. And so, and it's worldwide coverage as well. And so a couple of um, some commonly asked questions um, that we get asked quite regularly is what if I already have life insurance? So one of the things to keep in mind is regular life insurance policies, like you're talking like not the funeral insurance policy, like we were talking about earlier, but a life insurance like with State Farm or, you know, a Prudential, um, something like that. The life insurance has to be claimed by a death certificate. And so a lot of people don't realize that you, your family has to wait for those death certificates to come in. Sadly enough, you heard what Christy talked about earlier during COVID. I know that's kind of a, was a trying time for a lot of things, but death certificates are issued by the state. And if they're not issued right away, like during COVID, there were some certificates that were not issued for six months. Well, people can't file a life insurance policy unless you have a death certificate. So people end up having to pay out of pocket. So having a regular life insurance doesn't mean that you're going to have it available immediate funds to you when you pass away. A lot of people don't realize that. So why a funeral home pre-plan versus other insurance? One of the biggest things that we see is a Medicaid spend down and irrevocability. So a Medicaid spend down is what if you don't have long-term health care? and you have to go into a facility later on in life. We don't know what that cost is gonna be for your care. It could be three, five, $10,000 a month, depending on the level of care you have. 
Well, one of the things to qualify, if your family can't afford that monthly payment, you have to qualify for Medicaid and it's called a Medicaid spend down. But the great thing about a funeral home pre-plan is you, we mark it irrevocable. It is the only insurance policy that you can make irrevocable and it's, protect, it's considered a pre protected asset. Um, Medicaid cannot touch that money. It is only to be used for your funeral plan. So that's a really great benefit of a great place to hold your funds. Um, also, one of the things is when you think about a uh, funeral pre-plan versus uh, a regular life insurance. You'll see on TV the advertisements for um, a celebrity talking about, you know, get your burial expense. That's just a regular life insurance policy. That's not a funeral home life insurance. Those are not made irrevocable. So your money is not protected. Um, one of the things I, I just did a Medicaid spend down yesterday. Um, a gentleman, his mom is, is being put in a facility and we are doing a Medicaid spend down to, to protect the money. So the monies that they pre-planned for this is protected in the policy. We do um, probably three to seven Medicaid spend downs per month. The first thing that happens is Medicaid says, does, does your loved one have a life insurance policy? Like State Farm, like a regular life insurance. The first thing Medicaid says, go cash that life insurance policy and go open a funeral plan. That's the first thing they tell them to do. And it's because we can make them irrevocable. So it's a good thing. We talked about if I move, that goes with you as long as well as the out of area protection. So it's transferable to anywhere you go. Some additional questions is we get, is cremation cheaper than burial? It can be, but not always. I've done cremation plans that are $15,000. And I've done a burial plan that's 8,000. So it all depends on what you want. It's every plan that we do is customizable and um, uh, it's just all based on what you choose for your, your type of services you want, the merchandise you want. In average, yes, cremation can be cheaper than burial. However, it all depends on um, what you select for your planning. And we'll go over that when we, we talk about that. Do all funeral homes have their own crematory? Not every funeral home has their own crematory. So as you're looking at your options in, in, the, in the city and talking with different funeral homes, make sure you're asking them that. You know, French has their own crematory. It's at Sunset Memorial Park. That's our French um, uh, cemetery down on Manal and Edith. And that is where our crematory is. So once you were brought into our care, you stay, into our, you stay in our care until the burial. And who can get a pre-planned policy? Anybody can. It doesn't even matter if you have health conditions, I can still set up a life insurance policy for a funeral plan. Um, that's something you'll see a regular life insurance policy, you can't do that. They ask you health questions and you actually can get denied because of health, health conditions. I have done, the youngest I've done is a pre-plan is somebody who is six years old up to somebody who is 103. So I had a gentleman who pre-planned for his entire family. He planned for his his him and his wife, his two children, ages six and nine, and also his mother-in-law and his mother. And so we got that all done. The oldest person I did was 103. And believe it or not, I love sharing the story. She came in on her birthday and she came in, she came in with her daughter. She had her little cane and um, she comes in and she, and I'm putting in her information and I'm pulling it up and I'm looking at the date and I'm like doing the math in my head. And I'm like, oh my gosh, today's her birthday. And then I'm doing the math and I'm like, she's 103. And so I said, ma'am, what made you decide to come in on your 103rd birthday and do your pre-plan with me? And she goes, well, Barbara, I thought it was about time. <laughs> so I said, well, I, I think that's good. So I was very happy to help her do her plan. Um, God love her. She lived another two years, you guys. She lived to be 105. So that's never too late to do your plan. <laughs> All right. And then what if I want to donate my body to science? <clears throat> this is a topic I could talk about for a little while, and I'm just going to kind of touch on a few things. Um, COVID kind of changed a lot of things um, for us. And we have people who um, want to donate their body to science and that's great and you know it and it's a good thing. But what a lot of people don't realize is it all depends on your health. It depends on the health of your body at the time. They may not accept you. 
And that's something a lot of people don't know. And then also, what if um, they have a capacity, they can only take so many cadavers. And so they're at a limit on how many they can take in. So if they reach capacity, they have to turn your family away. So mom's wish of wanting to have her body donated and studied isn't going to happen. So they end up having to call the funeral home and start from scratch. So we always recommend having a plan B. Do set up with a UNM anatomical donation and have your body, you know, donated to science and have that plan, but have a plan B and we're plan B. Set up your funeral pre-plan so it's in, in, in plan, in place. Now, to kind of go back to um, what you had said, Ms. Taylor, is, you know, what happens to that money? Well, if, if the funeral plan is used, or excuse me, the anatomical donation is used, and then you've got this life insurance policy with the funeral home, your family waits for the death certificate to come in, they file it, and they get that money back. So you never lose that money. So having your plan B is really good. Now I'm gonna to touch really quick on COVID. During COVID, they were not taking anyone in the anatomical donation for a year and a half. And so all of those families who thought that they could be taken care of and, and have their body studied, they were turning people away. They couldn't take anybody in during COVID. So who knows what our life is gonna be in the future and what, where it's gonna be in our world. So we can't always rely on anatomical donation. Can I have my family scatter my ashes? You can, um, but there's laws on that and, and there's regulations on that where you can do it. So um, I always usually go over that with families and let them know, um, you know, you should get a permit. If you scatter, um, you know, under the rose bush in the backyard, you have to remember, you know, 50 years from now, is that gonna be a Walmart parking lot? You know, you wanna think about something thoughtful and, and where's the place of remembrance, you know? So I always recommend at least look at a, a cemetery, even for a scatter garden at this like Sunset Memorial Park, we have a beautiful scatter garden there. So, you know, there's options available for you for scattering. And then what are veteran benefits um, for veterans and their spouse? I usually, as we work with the VA every, every all the time in our business. And so we talk a lot with our veterans memorial program and help educate veterans about the benefits that are available to them. And then also French has some benefits available to veterans and their spouse as well. And so we like to help educate families on that. And then are some funeral homes cheaper than others? Um, you know, in the most, most of the funeral homes across the city, um, we're pretty comparable. When we, we know what each other, which each funeral home is paying, you know, and, and what families will anticipate to pay. It's very comparable across the, across the country, uh, across the city, excuse me. Um, there are some funeral homes that may be less expensive, but one of the things we always tell people, if you go to one of those funeral homes, please keep in mind, we would love to review that with you to make sure that they've covered everything for you. We're very thorough in what we do and make sure, so use us as a resource. You know, if you go and talk to a funeral home and you wanna make sure that things are covered for your family, cause that's why we're doing it, right? Bring it to us and let us review it with you to make sure that everything is covered for your family. So there are all other options available to you, but um, definitely look in detail at everything. And then will the funeral home help my family after I'm gone? Um, not all funeral homes do, but I'm proud to say that French offers a couple of things to families after they've, after they've passed and lost a loved one. The first thing is our grief counseling. We offer a, a program, it's called um, Everything After. And it's a program that offers grief counseling to families. There's no cost for this. We also have an on-staff grief counselor that will help um, and provide three sessions to any family, family member. Um, not a lot of funeral homes offer that. And the other thing that the Everything After program offers is to help educate family, give them some base information um, about estate planning. Kind of like what Christy was saying, if you don't have things in place, there's a lot of questions that come up when you do not have an estate plan in place. And so we highly recommend to people as we pre-plan, get your estate planning done, get your will done, you know, avoid probate, <laughs> you know, go through the things, um, go talk to an estate lawyer. So um, having everything done and taken care of, but there's questions that come up that people just maybe a spouse needs help with. 
our Everything After program actually helps them do those things. They'll help them do those tasks. They'll even be on the phone with them and help them make a phone call to PNM because they're not sure how to handle talking to PNM about their spouse that just passed and how to remove their name. So our Everything After program is quite incredible. So All right. So um, Jillian's going to put the poll back in the in the chat if you can hit it and please answer the questions and you can if you leave your browser open you can do it afterwards but please fill that out and then just a big thank you again and as i said probably early next week we will send out an email to everyone registered that will have the link to the recording this recording and include contact information for all the presenters and thank you to them again again thank you again to the sponsors we couldn't do this without our sponsors, French has done it for two years in a row, AARP New Mexico and Encenda too. So thank you so much. And, thank you. And, um, just one last thing before we leave is um, actually October 8th, we celebrated two years as a nonprofit. So as a, as a social enterprise, I should say a social profit. So, and we couldn't do it without sponsors, without the grants that we've received and without everyone um, who attends these events and supports us. So thank you so much.